Well, welcome everybody to this week's Wednesday seminar, Geoscience Australia. Uh, my name is Andrew Heap. I'm the Chief of the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division here at GA. And it's with my great pleasure to introduce our special guest today, which is Tom Bernicker, who's going to be giving his Distinguished Geoscience Australia lecture, which is fantastic. Uh, but before I introduce Tom and what he's going to talk about, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of all the lands on which we are meeting today, which in Canberra are the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in the seminar today. So as I said, today's Distinguished Geoscience Australia lecturer is Dr Tom Bernicker, and he will be presenting From Extraction to Injection, Australia's Subsurface Energy Resources Potential. Australia, like the rest of the world, is looking forward to implementing a range of initiatives to support its transition to a low carbon future. Tom's presentation will focus on emerging energy resource commodities that have placed Australia on its path to a low carbon economy, and how Geoscience Australia is supporting the industry's adaptation to the required changing in the energy mix. Starting with an overview of Australia's oil and gas exploration history, Tom's talk will highlight the many significant discoveries, the remaining resource potential, and the emergence of new energy resource commodities. So a little bit about Tom. Tom is a sediment geologist, petroleum geologist, who holds an MSc from the University of Aachen in Germany and a PhD from Melbourne's La Trobe University. Tom's early work focused on the development of models for siliciclastic and carbonate depositional systems in Northwest Europe and in Australia. After a lectureship at the University of Melbourne, Tom joined the Victorian Department of Natural Resources and Energy, where his work focused on the hydrocarbon prospectivity of the Gippsland and Otway basins. Tom joined Geoscience Australia as the team leader for the onshore hydrocarbon project in 2007, and from 2009 onwards has been the, the leader of the offshore acreage release program, including the promotion of investment opportunities in Australia's energy sector. Tom is currently the Director of the Energy Resources and Advice and Promotion Directorate in the, in the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division. He is a member of the Petroleum Exploration Society of Australia, the Society of Sedimentary Geology, and the Southeast Asian Petroleum Exploration Society. Please welcome Tom to the podium. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. It's my pleasure to be able to present to you today some of the work that has been carried out is ongoing in uh, the energy resource assessment area. And um, what I would like to do is um, there we are. Um, just start off by uh, talking a little bit about the history of oil and gas in Australia. So the, the talk will actually focus on oil and gas rather than coal and uranium, although it will get a, a short mention. Uh, I'd like to talk about early discoveries, the gas deregulation that has been really important in driving Australia's industry, the pipeline network. But I'd like to spend a little bit of time on Geoscience Australia's pre-competitive petroleum programs that have enabled us to really gather an enormous, enormous amount of knowledge on uh, the um, uh, resource potential in Australia. And then I want to uh, switch over and talk about GA's role in decarbonizing Australia's economy before I then um, uh, uh, provide some conclusions on, um, <clears throat> on the programs. Now, if there are two messages that I'd like you to take away from today's presentation is A, Geoscience Australia knows a lot about our subsurface resources and Geoscience Australia is prepared to really tackle all the challenges that are coming towards us in the science related to decarbonizing our economy. <clears throat> so let's just kick off early discoveries, a um, little bit of black and white stuff here. A rough range was the first one that actually identified f first free-flowing oil in the subsurface from a reservoir of uh, lower, Cretaceous, lower Cretaceous age, and the oil flowed at a rate of uh, 500 bil um, barrels per day, which is at the time was probably quite significant. So very rapidly, um, the Northern Carnarvon Basin established itself as a focus area for the industry, and over the coming decades, um, 
the Northern Kadawan Basin established itself rapidly as a premier hydrocarbon province of offshore Australia. The other, side, the other continent, um, Lake Banga, I don't have an image of that, it's hard to find, but I uh, put an in, in image of the lake's entrance oil shaft in. So Lake Banga was drilled in 1924 um, after the Commonwealth offered a 50,000 pound reward for the discovery of the first commercial oil field in Australia. So it was really early time after the First World War when the Commonwealth government wanted to find out what the potential in oil uh, reserves and uh, potential is in, uh, in, in, in the Australian, um, <clears throat> uh, in, in all of Australia. So the first well only to, uh, identified traces of oil, but later on, following a 60 well uh, um, drilling campaign, it cul culminated in the lakes into this oil shaft, um, which produced a, a total of 5,000 barrels of oil. The oil was very, very viscous, very hard to produce. As you can see, 40 to 60 API, that means it, it's very, very, very dense and very, very heavy. It's like um, a Vegemite almost. <clears throat> then things really kicked off very rapidly. In the uh, mid-60s, um, uh, somebody with a um, smart view, uh, strategies, looked out at the Gibson Basin and said there will be oil down there. The first seismic was acquired, and you can see here, just a simple structure was enough to target a really large, the, one of the largest gas fields in the Gibson Basins very early on. Um, it was 100 to 525 of gas column, and it has been had production since the 1960s. Um, at the time, the Commonwealth sub, um, uh, provided a subsidy for 50% of all costs um, incurred by providing a fully caught um, a drill core, drill um, exploration well. The Barracuda One um, <clears throat> discovery was very rapidly followed by major discoveries at Marlin and Kingfish, and before 1970, Gippsland was established as a very, very important world-class hydrocarbon province. And those sort of uh, positive discoveries led um, Konecki uh, then, in 1972, a government representative to say, well, Australia actually given those sort of successes, it's likely to host 120 billion barrels of oil. This was done just by ex estimation, expo extrapolating uh, what was happening on the continental shelf in Gippsland. However, the reality really is that it took another 40 years and many, many, many billions of dollars for investment to discover an additional 3 billion barrels. So just for completion's sake, the Cooper Basin was discovered in 1963, and in the same year, oil was produced from the Marini oil and gas field in, uh, in the Amadeus Basin. So I mentioned gas deregulation. Uh, this bill that is uh, highlighted up there is a very, very interesting read, and it really um, portrays the government way of thinking to ensure um, uh, energy security and energy supply is, can be guaranteed for the, uh, for the forthcoming decades. <clears throat> So this bill established the third, third party access to natural gas pipeline, pipeline, and it was really in the context realizing that Australia's hydrocarbon resources are actually dominated by gas rather than by liquid petroleum. And at the time, natural gas was already classified as a lower emission fuel compared to the dominance of coal and diesel. So these maps are actually the current uh, pipeline maps, and um, what is very interesting that in 2000, this link between Melbourne and Sydney was completed just in time to provide gas for uh, lighting up the Olympic flame at uh, the Sydney Games. On the other side in Victoria, the linkage between Melbourne and Adelaide was established with the Sea Gas Pipeline, Southeastern Australia Gas Pipeline, and that completed the loop between Adelaide, Moomba, and Sydney, closing uh, the supply chain in the southeastern gas market. <clears throat> so let's go talk about GA's petroleum programs. Very early on, Geoscience Australia really investigated with the um, great work of the uh, various teams of geochemists identifying the various petroleum systems, coming to an understanding that that work can actually identify paleogeographic context and really mapping out um, the resources in Australia. So this slide uh, is Marita Bradshaw's work. Um, uh, she had uh, headed up a team of uh, um, scientists, and she was the one instrumental in defining Australia's petroleum super systems, identifying the Laropintine, the early Paleozoic one, which is uh, dominated by marine source rocks um, spanning, spanning the region from Australia to then China. 
We got one and one, one and one defines the late Paleozoic systems. This is a period of mountain building, glaciation, and also later on coal deposition, different uh, source rock altogether. And then the Westralian and the Austral petroleum systems define rifted margins, the Westralian one on the northwest shelf, the Austral system on the southern margin. This is the time when deltaic systems became really the focus of um, uh, petroleum system development and also um, still are the key targets of their, for their um, ex exploration efforts. Then later on in the Kenozoic, when uh, Australia collided with the uh, um, Asian uh, plate, um, trap formation occurred, but also trap, some trap, uh, traps were dis destroyed and reactivation of fault, um, of faults um, um, uh, uh, proceeded. <coughs> Very early on also, um, Austra Geoscience Australia in 1986, still under BMR um, a label, identified the world's oldest oil. It came out of the MacArthur Basin and uh, it was uh, a, a collected sample that bubbled out to, to the surface. It was um, dated, analyzed, dated, and it really did an age of 1.7 billion years old. This is the oldest identified hydrocarbon in the world. Later on, you see Chris Borum here um, examining uh, the uh, a gas sample from the Shenandoah One well in the Beetaloo subbasin, identifying very, very similar identical ages. Um, the question is, is it the same source rock? But the, the system overall is the old um, uh, pre Mesozoic petroleum system that now is the focus of attention by explorers in northern Australia. So summarizing Australia's oil and gas resources through time, again, this is Marita Bradshaw's work. Bradshaw's work. So Australia really has um, petroleum systems that span the entire stratigraphic column. So you can see here from uh, the Lara Pinta and Gondwanen, the Australian uh, Austral pit systems. And we also identify that the oldest commercial production comes from the Ordovician in the Amadeus Basin. And the production, as indicated from the Proterozoic in the MacArthur, is imminent. Um, a proof of concept has been established, and we're just waiting for um, the drilling to commence and the production to uh, identify um, the real value of the uh, quite extensive resource in northern Australia. So then we switch uh, over a little bit later to later, uh, the government announcement in 2003 when the big new oil program was at, uh, at, uh, announced during uh, budget. This is a four-year program of data collection designed to develop new exploration of, um, opportunities aimed at underexplored regions and also importantly deliver the results, deliver the new results in support of the acreage release. So much of the prog initial program was focused on marine surveys, on seepage um, identification, um, um, uh, marine sampling, uh, uh, swath mapping, uh, more, more seepage in uh, the northwest shelf, and uh, finally, uh, a big, big um, program, uh, the Bite Basin Sampling Survey, um, that resulted in quite significant um, uh, understanding of the hydrocarbon prospectivity of this underexplored or unexplored region at the time. So snapshots here, and this story has been told many, many times. Um, sampling from inside canyons has allowed the retrieval of an older, older sedimentary, sedimentary strata. And here is the key aspect what the Bite Basin is all about. Quite boring, really unattractive looking rocks. But if you look at the analytical data, this is the one that really attracted many, many companies to take out exploration licenses in the Bite Basin and confirmed during their exploration program the very strong hydrocarbon prospectivity of that region. Interestingly, and from a global perspective, the source rock was identified to match uh, in terms of age and geochemistry, the global oceanic anoxic event, which was a time during which large amounts of um, uh, organic matter were able to be preserved. We go a little bit further down the track. In August 2006, um, the Prime Minister at the time announced, announced the Energy initiative, Initiatives Statement and provided extra millions of dollars for an onshore and offshore activity programs. The onshore activities was um, designed to identify potential onshore energy sources such as petroleum, geothermal, and also uranium. <clears throat> 
The offshore activity were meant to expand on the good, big good world program with new data acquisition and a much better improved understanding on uh, the hydrocarbon prospectivity. It was already realized and it's still being realized that Australia remains relatively unexplored and at the time the offshore uh, frontier areas were under very strong focus. So just a couple of snapshots here. The um, Bremer subbase sub study um, revealed that we have um, really good um, in, uh, uh, sealing, sealing rocks. We know from a seepage survey that there's an active petroleum system. So having that a, a sealing uh, sequence in place is uh, very important. And an interpretation was also put forward that there is a major salt wedge um, developed that is uh, attractive for explorers because we know that's one of the best sealing uh, capacities that there is. Another program, um, quite a, a major multidisciplinary study was uh, targeting the offshore northern Perth Basin. There's the integration of seismic data, biostratigraphy, and uh, petroleum system modeling. It was complemented by a fault integrity study by CSIRO and the work was uh, released in direct support of the 2011 acreage release and um, resulted in the um, uh, multiple bits were received and in the award uh, for an explorer that came on board with a guaranteed three well exploration program in the commitment term. So from a government perspective, really all the results, all the requirements in making, uh, uh, providing much better understanding of offshore resources and the potential were achieved. So that brings me then to then, um, <coughs> the offshore acreage release. Uh, very briefly, I'd like to just uh, discuss some of the aspects here. What are companies looking for and for sort of uh, material, what sort of information do we at Geoscience Australia provide? We will talk about is the area that is uh, on offer in a mature or an underexplored region. Do we looking at deep or shallow water? What is the access to infrastructure? Very importantly, we want to highlight the exploration history because that really gives a guidance of what previous explorers have identified or have missed. The basin geology and the dominant exploration concepts or play types are also um, quite important to, to, um, to provide information about. Then addressing the exploration uncertainties, this is pretty much what three companies are doing with data coverage. First of all, the reservoir quality, migration pathways, seal integrity, and all the, the details around capturing and managing uh, hydrocarbon uh, accumulations is then very important. So Geoscience Australia continues to support the aid release and has done so for many, many years. Uh, and we do this now with access to open file data through our repository and via the NOPIMS um, uh, tool. We also provide a comprehensive petroleum geological information about the petroleum geology in those various basins and release areas. And this has actually been seen as a very a good benefit for companies who just want to screen opportunities who are not necessarily very familiar with the Australian petroleum geology. So what I will like do now is just to give you a rundown of 20 years worth or 22 years worth of acreage release. It all kicked off from the government perspective in 1998 um, when the oil price was around $14. <clears throat> the government wanted to really increase encouragement to look at uh, underexplored frontier regions at the, at the time. So we start off with 1999, and already 1999, the Bight Basin was um, uh, uh, experiencing a very large release. And uh, in 2000, um, over 80 release areas were uh, put forward, and uh, the three first exploration permits were awarded in the Bight Basin. Then in 2001, there was a large release in offshore Perth. Multiple areas released in Otway, Bass, and Gippsland in 2002, uh, and nine exploration permits awarded in the offshore Perth Basin as early as 2003. And then um, in 2004, um, realizing there's now the gas deregulation and gas discoveries can be made, there were 20 new exploration permits awarded across the Otway Basin and Gippsland Basins. Uh, by 2005, as you can see here, the Northern Carnarvon has been expanded and it really at that point has been established as the premier hydrocarbon province in offshore Australia. 2006, 2007, uh, this and 2008 is now the time when the Badu sub-basin areas were released. 
And in the Bight Basin, those permits were relinquished because of failure, uh, Nalinox 1, failing to reach the primary objective. So straight away after in 2009, this was a final year when the government released acreage under the designated frontier area program, which allowed 30% of the exploration um, spent expenditure to be written off. Um, so new areas were released following also the positive results from Geoscience Australia's study. A year later, year later five permits were awarded in the Bidu Basin, and those are the areas that ultimately led to the discovery of Phoenix South, Dorado, and the rock oil and gas discoveries. So we go further uh, forward, new areas uh, continue to be released in the White Basin, given that some major company came on board, confirmed the prospectivity, so more and more people wanted to have um, want to participate in these exploration programs. By 2014, we can see in the Northern Carnarvon Basin, everything was pretty much taken up under license, and smaller areas became available um, due to forced relinquishments after the six-year initial work program. No new release areas uh, along the entire southern margin at the time. <clears throat> we move forward to 2017-18, and then we have, um, again, driven by the requirement for additional gas volumes in southeastern Australia, um, the resurgence of Otway Gibson Basin interest, uh, uh, offering um, uh, good locations to make additional discoveries, which uh, have been proven successful. So and then we sort of finish off, and the latest one uh, last year is the large, largest frontier area ever released in the Otway Basin following and supported by Geoscience Australia's current Otway uh, deep water program. This is an amazing frontier, and the idea really is trying to identify a possible liquid potential, not only natural gas. So we can sort of summarize all this in, uh, in the historical um, development of the acreage release, and what you can see here is the number of release areas in red, the number of release areas that receive bids, number of exploration permits granted, and the total number of bids received against the average global oil price. What you can see very clearly clear is that the most successful phase of the offshore acreage release was around 2004 to 2012-13. After then, the global downturn occurred, um, the oil price dropped, and things really changed. But during that time, that central time there, the number of exploration permits granted matches actually the number of release areas that received bids. And this has never really achieved ever since. You can go now towards the uh, 2015 and 2020 uh, part of, of the diagram and you can see lots of release areas, few bids and fewer um, exploration permits awarded. And that trend has continued. It is very clear right now the industry is not really prepared to invest into high-risk areas. Their focus is on developing known resources. So we have to wait and see what will uh, come in the next couple of years, because obviously there is now uh, energy shortage, and there is a need to really, and the industry is really waiting for it, to um, access um, further exploration opportunities. So, so much for the offshore acreage release, and we go and turn our focus now to onshore. GA's onshore energy security program uh, received 60 million years over five years, and um, as indicated, was targeting the resource potential of hydrocarbons, uranium, thorium, but also the geothermal energy. So, a part of that program includes the National Geochemical Survey, an assessment of uranium systems, where do we have uh, geothermal potential, and also the establishment and the new acquisition of deep seismic um, programs. You can possibly see this as a prequel, an early prequel to the current um, Exploring for the Future program that is currently um, carried out and has um, achieved an uh, enormous amount of results. <clears throat> when we talked about hydrocarbons, um, uh, the focus was on those areas uh, that um, is not in production, so we have several areas there. There were minor oil production, coal seam gas, obviously a very big one. But the focus of the, um, uh, the program really focused in on those uh, sections in the basins where only hydrocarbon shows were identified, and although previous exploration has been carried out. 
And this sort of continues to the modern day, where we go back into some of the Centralian Basin areas, trying to identify why did certain areas not work in terms of making uh, commercial successes. So back to the program, uh, numerous really deep uh, seismic lines or seismic surveys were acquired at the time, trying to identify basin architecture, unconformities, and the deformation. But also at the time, this is now going back to Chris Borum and myself, trying to, um, uh, and spurred on by the interest in unconventional uh, uh, resources, trying to test out our screening if there is potential in Australia to actually host unconventional hydrocarbons. So we did this in conjunction with uh, the Potsdam uh, Geochem Lab, and the results, the initial results, were very promising. At the same time, the uh, United States EAI agency um, uh, scanned globally the, the potential for unconventional resources and came up with a number 396 TCF in Australia in multiple basins without really making it the point and making it clear what that number is based on. We're coming back to that. <clears throat> so, strategy 2028. Um, much of our work is in the context of building Australia's resources wealth. And I, highlighted, I highlight two um, aspects here when it comes to energy. We will map and understand Australia's energy resources reversing Australia's increasing dependence on oil imports and increasing domestic gas supplies. This will be a challenge, reversing the trend, because we are very, very much dependent on liquid importations. And of course, and this is now sort of the new area of our uh, engagement, we will advance clean energy technology that underpin Australia's greenhouse gas emission targets. So let's just set the scene and uh, step back a little bit and look at um, some of the forecasts in the global energy mix here. It's global, so we're talking global. Different countries may have different uh, settings, but overall, and various uh, predictions are pretty much on the same page. The gist here is that by 2050, the amount of renewable energy will really outperform anything else. It will increase to over 80% of the global energy mix. But what we also can see is that coal, natural gas, will continue to play a role, albeit at a much smaller percentage. So this is um, the message that really uh, needs to be uh, made, that if we want to increase the, uh, the, the participation of renewable energies in the energy mix, um, we cannot uh, uh, shut off natural gas and for the time being, if certainly from an Australia perspective, uh, the coal resources. And we can look at Australia's energy production here. Um, this comes out of the latest ACA publication. So this is by fuel type and compared to the previous publication, uh, black coal in Australia continues to continue the dominant fuel type. This is not a surprise. The production of natural gas has increased uh, to by 7.9% in the forecasting period. And interestingly, the amount of renewables in energy production, petajoules, is relatively small. The component is really relatively small. But when we look at electricity consumption by fuel, and this is, I recommend this website from the National Energy Market Operator. Anybody can go there and you can really monitor what's going on in terms of consumption every day, over a year, over 10 years, over many months. I selected here the period June 2021 to June 2022, so last year, one year period. And what you can see here is the amount of coal and gas versus the amount of hydro, wind and solar contributing to the energy consumption. So over 60% in that period of time uh, came from black and brown coal in Australia. The renewables contributed uh, 33% and natural gas only contributed 6.3%. This reflects very clearly that a lot of volumes that we have in gas is actually being exported. So the message, um, again, is the reduction of coal and expansion of renewables, if you really want to go down that path, requires the increase of utilizing our natural gas resources. So just uh, very briefly, just to, to complete this, uh, this uh, story a little bit, you can see here our um, uh, 30 years, Australia's energy consumption and export really ramping up after 2005 with major discoveries coming online from the Northwest Shelf. 
And when it comes to oil and energy export um, by volume and the value, you can see again a very steep increase um, after 2012. And um, as is now uh, represented in the ACO uh, publication, uh, there is a drop, it was a drop off in 2019, clearly related to the re reduced energy demand due to um, the COVID pandemic. So let's look at um, the uh, overall Australia's remaining gas reserves and contingent resources. This, as I said, is a brand new publication. It is, was released by the minister, formally by the minister yesterday. And you can see here our resource endowment in natural gas is actually very significant. We also have a total unconventional resource, resource potential estimated at the moment at 11 TCF. <clears throat> so um, I really want to make the point, this is now uh, accessible online, has the full reporting, all the maps, all the data tables are behind it. It is uh, a, a really, really worthwhile publication and um, uh, complete now a major effort by the team at Geoscience Australia. Just let's talk about oil. Um, oil does really, in terms of our resource potential, not really that crash hot. Um, we currently importing more, of eight, more than 80% of our requirements. So the existing producing oil fields are in rapid decline. Um, we have new emerging, uh, emerging hydrocarbon provinces, certainly the Bidu Subbasin, that's gonna be put in production in the next three to four years. So the total demonstrated resources are about um, just under uh, 900 million barrels, but 75% of these, again, are exported for refinery and then we re-import those uh, for our own purposes. So very clearly, and uh, this is a government messaging, the reliance on imports very negatively impacts our energy security. So that comes out to our role now in resource assessment. <clears throat> Not all resource numbers are created equal, and what you can see here uh, on the chart, which is the International Standard Petroleum Resource Classification Diagram, you can really subdivide this into reserves, a lot of where you know what you have, you can talk about contingent resources, the, the ones that are able to you under certain economic scenarios, and you can talk about prospective resources. The lower one is very, very dodgy because you really are relying on a lot of assumptions without any production numbers or any, any evidence for hydrocarbon flow, uh, flow. So this remains very speculative, and we know that these numbers are very popular with certain people who then sort of go out and take these numbers and talk about enormous resource potentials in certain areas that are really based on very, very dodgy assumptions. <coughs> so what we do, if you want to have a proper resource assessment, we have to integrate um, uh, a lot of disciplines, stratigraphic framework, the geological framework, but then also the entire suite of petroleum system related studies into modeling, cause and cuttings analysis, seismic interpretation becomes important, but also the overall correlation of um, areas area that have uh, experienced previous exploration and we want to understand what worked and what did not work. So this comes to the value of play mapping and um, Geoscience Australia is now in the lucky position that we have obtained the GISPEX player license that enables us really to come up with a, a much better view and a much better understanding on the various um, uh, um, components. We're talking about reservoir, seal, trap and charge. And what we can do with this is we provide a systematic assessment that is repeatable and based on real science data input. What we do is we're looking at reservoir seal pairs and we sort of identify these play types over a, a certain area but also for over a certain region. The chronostatigraphic play scheme allows then uh, the assessment of time correlation across larger areas and we are now also in the position to not only target hydrocarbons, oil and gas, we can, also, we can look at hydrocarbon uh, unconventional like uh, calcium gas, we can look at hydrogen uh, commodity, and we can use, use this also for enhanced oil recovery, which I will talk about in a minute. So the player um, uh, module or the tool was developed with conventional hydrocarbons in mind, but they are also now um, able to modify uh, the tool to, uh, to allow for the assessment of unconventional hydrocarbons. And also with our input, we are talking that we can use this for geological storage for CCS purposes.
Very clearly, if a well failed because there were no hydrocarbons, it still can mean there is a good reservoir system that is capable of storing carbon dioxide. And we can use the same thing then for um, groundwater related uh, questions and even for um, sediment hosted resources because what we really talk about here is crustal fluids. So where are we looking? Um, I'll come back to this map here now. So the Western Aramanga province uh, is currently a, a key focus. Again, just outside the Cooper Basin and we want to know um, um, what is the, um, the remaining potential or what is the potential overall given that it's so closely related to one of the premier onshore hydrocarbon provinces. So we're looking there at oil, uh, oil gas, coal seam gas, and even deep-seated hot aquifers. In the Amadis and Officer Basin, older um, Proterozoic basins, uh, we're looking at conventional oil and gas, some shale gas, but also hydrogen, helium, and salt for hydrogen storage. In the Edavel and Galilee basins, we're looking at conventional gas, coal seam gas, and salt. And in the South Nicholson Basin, um, uh, recent successes uh, from the EFTF program, we're looking into uh, the prospectivity of shale gas in that region. And then further um, out in the west, the Canning Basin, the Kitson Subbasin remains as a premier target for shale gas and also um, as it hosts salt is of uh, high interest. What we do know is from the legacy data that has been collected over many years is that the data indicates the prospectivity is there, petroleum systems do exist, but to be developed in the future, many of these areas require the expansion of infrastructure. So here's an example of um, uh, the post-drill analysis. It's one of the first steps in any sort of resource assessment. You need to understand um, why certain areas worked and why certain areas failed. We can use this here as an example in the Pedroca Simpson region, where we're looking at 36 conventional wells. So we can identify the various play types, again, reservoir seal pairs, and then really assess um, which sections may actually be working in terms of risk assessment, low, medium, high. Are they capable of hosting conventional hydrocarbons? Are they capable of sealing capacity? Do they have reservoir areas that can be used for storage? Here's another example of the shallower section. Um, we do this in uh, cooperation with our colleagues in uh, South Australia. Um, so you can see here uh, a previous um, play map area where we identify hydrocarbons. The identification of oil migration from the depot center in the center of the map uh, indicates that oil migration happens towards the western flank. And we really need to understand why that is only on that side. Uh, rather than on uh, the, towards the east. And as you can see by the uh, lock interpretation, although the time slices are identical, the fasciest relationships really predict that it is much easier to migrate um, um, areas, um, hydrocarbons up towards the western flank than in the east, given that the shale richness in uh, the Contreira well uh, is uh, making it difficult for hydrocarbons to accumulate. Having said that, again, the reservoir facies itself may lend to further investigations identifying uh, uh, carbon storage potential. It brings me to the geological and bioregional assessment that Geoscience Australia has also been carried out, and this is a really, really important project or um, undertaking. These areas, and this is the example from the Betaloo Subbasin, does not only talk about geology, geological framework, and tectonic architecture. It assesses the petroleum resource, in this case, the shale gas distribution. It assesses the presence and um, uh, uh, connectivity of hydrogeology and surface water. But importantly, this type of approach also identifies areas that may be very sensitive for future development. And this is really the important aspect that the geoscience data can point towards the resource potential, but understanding the context with environmental sensitivities may actually result in, uh, in a, a much better guidance how to explore and how to develop these resources. So this is something the TEGI team is currently involved in, in the Edda Vale and North Carolina North Basin. So coming to um, a different topic here, um, carbon capture and storage, Geoscience Australia has a history of um, engaging in uh, these related studies. And as part of the outcome of the National CO2 Infrastructure Plan, 2016, this map was produced 
providing a ranking of the various basins in terms of storage potential. So green obviously is very good, um, uh, red is um, suboptimal. Um, I like to highlight what the government has done in, um, uh, in recent years. So first of all, several offshore provinces have been deemed highly suitable and this is the reason why we have currently five offshore areas available for um, storage exploration. Very clearly, um, the best storage potential is deemed to be related to younger rocks, Jurassic and younger, because of the limited tectonic and diagenetic overprint of these sequences. So the porosity is, is in, in, uh, uh, enhanced or um, preserved. So these are the areas that are, um, the government released last year. Um, uh, all these areas received multiple bids, and an announcement will be made in due course, I understand. I'd just like to um, focus on one example here from the Petrel Subbasin. This is the largest, the two largest areas that were released, um, quite large blocks, um, all in shallow water, and um, supported by the geological control by gas exploration wells. So the purpose here is that the storage will occur in saline aquifers, in the younger section in there, and the sources to be um, stored will come from the Darwin processing facilities, but also from future Bonaparte gas field developments. The overall potential was assessed by Geoscience Australia in a major study that was completed in 2014 and is freely available on our, um, on our web pages. So when we look at the petrol subbasin uh, stratigraphy here, so we know the um, hydrocarbon shows and producing wells in the um, Paleozoic section, while only minor gas shows have been identified in the Mesozoic section. So if we zoom in into this area here, when it comes to storage suitability, what we can see here, we have suitable reservoirs um, of various um, qualities, but importantly, we also have highly effective seals that will enable and will um, ensure that the uh, stored carbon dioxide can actually be held in place. So just summarizing this, five offshore release areas um, uh, um, uh, were released and uh, the government now is um, uh, inviting further nominations for future release for storage exploration. There are four aspects that are really important that anybody needs to be taking very seriously when it comes to um, uh, uh, carbon storage in, in, uh, in the subsurface. First of all, and most importantly, is the injectivity. You need to understand how much can you actually inject at the injection site. Then it has become important how long can, uh, how large is the overall capacity of that targeted reservoir unit. You need to then to um, ascertain yourself that you are able to um, really uh, contain the, uh, the migrating uh, carbon dioxide plume. And ultimately, you want to be able to monitor what has been, what's happening in the subsurface. And all this is currently ongoing and being tested very much in the Otway CO2 CSC uh, research project, where we re um, um, uh, gain a much really uh, very concise understanding of the behavior of carbon dioxide in the subsurface. Then we come uh, another program that is currently uh, um, uh, underway is the enhanced and recovery with CO2 storage, which means what you can unlock additional liquid potential in um, uh, residual oil zones by injecting uh, um, carbon dioxide and permanently storing uh, the carbon dioxide. So what this is, is really um, targeting residual oil zones that are water saturated, but still have a certain component of um, hydrocarbons and of liquid petroleum in them. We know this works very well by looking at this American example from the Permian Basin, uh, where you can see certain, this has been in operation for 70 years. Uh, first injection attempt really increased the, the production, and now they're looking at uh, a 30 degree um, injection with carbon dioxide, and the forecast is that they're likely to retrieve another 200 million barrels. Of course, everything seems to work really well in the United States, but the question is, do we find analogs here in Australia, and can we find producible residual oil zones? Here, initially, the focus is on the Cooper Aromanga region, and in cooperation with the CSRO, we are now um, evaluating uh, the data that is, uh, has been collected before and reviewing um, 
where the oil zones are and what can possibly classify or qualify as in a residual oil zones. Here it's all about um, um, understanding the resistivity log. And you can see two pay zones have been identified, but below the second uh, pay zone, there is still an indication of oil there, there, albeit in, uh, in, in mixed with water. So this potentially could be a candidate to inject carbon dioxide into and then uh, releasing and producing additional volumes of um, liquid hydrocarbons. So the um, identification is one aspect, and the second aspect then is what you also want to know. You want to understand how the reservoir actually behaves. So these are core flooding experiments that have been taken out, and we are in the lucky position um, that the industry is on board and provides us with core and with oil samples that can be utilized for these type of experiments. Ultimately, um, the the overall outcome of these studies is to come up with a economic feasibility map very similar to the economic fairway tool that is um, available for hydrogen, highlighting those areas that are suitable and economically feasible to um, invest in when it comes to hydrocarbon storage, uh, hydrocarbon storage but also for um, residual oil zones production. And I'd like to finish off pretty much with hydrogen. I don't really want to talk too much about it. This um, has been presented uh, on several occasions in recent months. Uh, the landmark paper by Borom et al. is really still on everybody's radar and is highly appreciated in terms of opening up the understanding on the um, distribution of hydrogen, not only in gases, but also native hydrogen in areas outside sedimentary basins. When it comes to um, hydrogen production, this is what it's all about. We want to produce hydrogen. Australia wants to become a hydrogen exporter. At the moment, the cost is pretty much driven by um, uh, the blue hydrogen, which is uh, price-wise um, compatible. Um, we want to achieve two, kilo, uh, two dollars per kilogram, and that is currently not um, possible, but Titan will um, tell that within the next five, eight, definitely in 10 years, by 2030, this will become very, very compatible and will be the way to produce hydro hydrogen. So by 2050, this is sort of a longer term forecast, it is very clear that hydrogen with the um, uh, renewable energy as the energy producer will become um, the, the dominant hydrogen producing agent. We need to also talk about a little bit about CO2 intensity when it comes to hydrogen production. So we have um, done in yellow. You can see if you don't do anything, you just use um, gas or coal to produce your hydrogen, you will create a lot of CO2. When you look at the top bit and you're utilizing coal, you can only um, really realistically um, proceed if you actually have a large capture rate of your CO2. And in the middle, uh, with, with gas, you, um, you are pretty much okay by a 50, 60% capture rate, but what you try to achieve here is capture 90% of the carbon produced and then um, uh, sequester it. The ultimate target, however, is you want to um, produce hydrogen by utilizing renewable and nuclear, if you can. That way you um, avoid um, generating CO2 emissions. So finally, I um, want to finish off. We're going back to injection. When we want to uh, enable a large um, hydrogen export industry, we need to have places where we can actually store the hydrogen. And there, one of the aspects there is identifying the distribution, the occurrence of suitable salt um, DIPS or salt uh, sequences, and this is currently going on as part of the EFDF program. Example in the officer basin, Previous seismic um, lines or seismic uh, interpretations indicated the presence of salts, but the, uh, the wells that were drilled failed to intersect any of those. So we are revis revisiting uh, this and trying to understand if the salt is there and if the salt is really suitable for future hydrogen storage. So that um, brings me to the end. Um, several messages, conclusions. Um, as I said before, Geoscience Australia does know a lot about subsurface um, resources. Um, this is what we do, and um, we have created an enormous amount of data that we make freely available. 
we are in the, in the, in, in the position that we can apply um, scientific rigor to, um, to support now the, the required change by the government in the energy mix. We want to participate in the decarbonization of the economy. So and that requires us um, working together as multidisciplinary uh, teams, which we do, and we want to assess the re energy resource potential, especially of those energy resource commodities that enable the transition to a low carbon economy. What we do is, uh, is get out uh, in very close cooperation with our state and territory colleagues, and where possible um, uh, with um, research organizations and with industry, as I pointed out, the industry in certain areas is fully on board in what we do and is very much in support of our program. So ultimately, the outcome of the studies will then demonstrate the untapped resource potential and we want to be in the position that we are able to inform government and industry decision makers about economically feasible and environmentally sustainable development of those uh, resources. So I'll leave you with a little bit of a musical um, greeting from 1975, and um, it was relevant then, and I'm pretty sure it's relevant now. So thank you very much. <clears throat>